So the story of the Bible is really the story of ancient Israel. And I'd like to give um, just something of the timeline of um, ancient Israel as uh, so with respect to the Bible. So um, this timeline, I'm going to talk about people and events uh, that shaped uh, the biblical narrative. And um, in, in terms of history, uh, some of it is not historically verified, but um, that's not, not necessarily relevant here because the, uh, the biblical story is a, it's a narrative of faith. And, you know, there are people who lived who there's no reason uh, will necessarily ever have any proof that they lived historically. Okay, but nonetheless, the stories of faith were passed on and they become part of this uh, tradition. So uh, the the timeline begins, at least um, in, in a relevant way, with a man by the name of Abraham. So Abraham uh, lived in what is modern-day Iraq, and he was called by, by God uh, to move to uh, the land of Canaan, which is the area around uh, where uh, is, that Israel occupies today. So uh, Abraham uh, leaves his land. Uh, he leaves with his uh, wife and uh, his household. And the household includes uh, not only his, his wife, he had no children at the time, uh, but it also includes you know, cousins, uh, servants, and um, people under his patronage. So he left with about 70 people. That was all, you know, a little, quite a, a group there. Now, you have to think about this. This is not in um, a current day uh, situation where if you are moving from, say, uh, Connecticut and you're going across the country to Seattle, um, you could look things up, you could find a place to stay, you could work out a, an employment situation ahead of time. You know what, where you're going to. Um, in the ancient world, this was simply not the case. And so for him to leave uh, his homeland and go out somewhere that he had never even known about was... Um, an act of faith. Okay, so God makes a promise to Abraham that Abraham would become the father of many nations. Okay, so that essentially he was going to have many descendants. Now this was a man who was uh, barren and had no children. Okay, but he, he believed God and he went out and um, settled in the land of uh, Canaan, where um, he his he was promised that his descendants would inherit. Okay, so from now, if Abraham lived, we we don't have any historic firm historical evidence about Abraham. Again, why would we? This is a single individual, very very long very long time ago. It would be very unusual to have um, any hard evidence uh, for his existence. But um, Abraham, let's just put his time about 1800 B.C., okay? Um, so, you know, this is to have an educated guess here. Now, Abraham had a child. His name was Isaac. Okay, and then Isaac had a um, son, or had a, a couple. Um, and the relevant one for our case, his name was Jacob, um, his name was eventually changed to Israel. Now, um, one thing I want to note here is that um, I said that God called Abraham from his land and told him to go somewhere, and he trusted this God. Now, Abraham was polytheistic. Okay, this was simply the world he lived in, and um, everyone believed in multiple gods. Okay, and so he's called by a particular God, and he trusts this God, and he goes to this place where this God leads him to. So he's put absolute faith in this God. Now, you know, we don't necessarily know under what name um, this God came to him as, but um, the, the God that's associated with Abraham in the Bible is um, the God El. Now, El was a popular God in the region, so in that region that's now Israel, um, there was a pantheon of gods, and El was a very popular god. El was the father of all gods. 
And in the Bible, um, you know, Abraham is it's uh, commonly um, so sort of associated with um, with the God El. Um, you know, so for instance, when God introduced Himself as God Most High, it's El Elyon. Now, um, in ancient Israel, um, they called God Elohim, which is the plural form of El, and so. Um, El could be the name of the individual God, but also it could mean God uh, in a very generic sense. Okay, but Elohim was was that God. So, now one thing I want to point out here is, um, in the ancient world, you had what are called theophoric names. Okay, so a theophoric name is a name that contains uh, the name of one's God. Okay, and so... um, if you look at the name Israel, you notice the L at the end there, and so um, Israel is a theophoric name. So a name like Michael um, is Rachel. Those are theophoric names, and you find them in um, many places around the world where you have names of people that include names of their gods, and uh, theophoric names can tell us something about um, the worship of that god and the tra- traditions and cultures of the people and um, how to date them. Okay, so it's interesting that Abraham, neither Abraham or Isaac, has a theophoric name as far as we can tell. And Jacob starts out this way with, um, with the name that is not theophoric, but become, he becomes Israel. Now, Israel, or Jacob, has um, 12 sons. And these sons are the ones we identify as the 12 tribes of Israel. So again, um, you you can think about this. Uh, so I'll, I'll continue the uh, timeline on the next slide, but I just want to point point out just how these things grow. So Abraham begins with a household, okay, about seventy people, and now any children born into that household are part of this you know, little you know family or or clan, okay. And then so you have Isaac who now um, it gets married and um, he begins to expand this and. <laughs> gradually you, you move you know from like a family or a household to a to a clan and then you get to a a tribe right and this is when you begin to expand and then gradually you can become a nation okay so as the household begins to multiply so as people join them people they're married you know, they, they marry um you know either locals or within the group um they they begin to expand and become uh, pretty large. So by the time we have the 12 sons of Jacob, you know, these are the ones identified as the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, at this point, they may not have been that large, but at least this is where um, Israel, uh, in in the future, that's future to this time period, right, um, will take their names from these sons. So we said you had the 12 sons of Israel who make up the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, um, so uh, there are a lot of things that happened, but eventually they moved to Egypt and settled there. And that's because initially because of a famine and they eventually settled there for a while. And in Egypt, they become enslaved. Now, the enslavement lasts uh, a long time. We don't know how long. So the Bible, you know, put out a number like 400 years. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. So um, we don't know how long, but they're enslaved in Egypt. And then a man by the name of Moses, okay, who is, is an Israelite, but he's raised as an Egyptian. Okay, so he's called um, by God to bring the people out of slavery in Egypt and bring them back to the land of Canaan. Now, Moses has an experience with God, and the God he has an experience with identifies himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, okay, and the God of Jacob. Right, so he identifies with that God, the God of his ancestors, but then he introduces himself by his personal name, 
Okay, and that name is Yahweh. Okay, let me rewrite that here. That's Yahweh. Okay, so now in ancient Israel, you then you have God understood under both names Elohim and Yahweh. And so, in the name of Yahweh, Moses returns to Egypt and demands that Pharaoh, um, the Egyptian king, lets Yahweh's people go. Now, from the perspective of, of the Pharaoh, it, this was completely baffling. Um, there was no, first of all, he had never heard of Yahweh. So, you'd see in the Bible, he says, who is this the Lord? And that's basically, who is Yahweh and why should I let these people go? Right. And so essentially what Yahweh does is Yahweh gets into a fight okay, with uh, the Egyptian gods. And Yahweh defeats them. Right? And the Egyptian gods were the most powerful gods at the time. And so this was absolutely stunning and uh, it cemented the people's faith in Yahweh. Okay? And so in the name of Yahweh, um, Moses leads the people out of Egypt, and this is known as the Exodus. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is, some would argue, the central event of this history. So it's a very solemn, very central mem memory. That the, when Yahweh re saved his people from enslavement and brought them out of slavery and um, led, you know, began to lead them back to the Promised Land. All right, so after uh, the, the, that's the exodus, um, they leave Egypt, and the people uh, make another covenant with Yahweh, right? So this covenant here um, and, uh, is in addition to um, the covenant that God made with Abraham. So that's A for Abraham, okay? And this is where... Um, Yahweh gives his people his law. Right, so Yahweh says, I'm going to be your king. You are going to be my people. Right, you belong to me. And he gives them the law. And this is usually called the law of Moses. Okay. And then, um, so it takes a while. Uh, the people have to sort of repopulate and build. And so they are in the wilderness for a long time. And then they slowly re -pop, or come into the land of Canaan. Um, and they are ruled by judges, people who are inspired by Yahweh to rule them. Um, and so for a period of time, they begin to settle and fill up the land so that that land becomes theirs, right? So there were people there, but they gradually came in and began to uh, a series of conquests, okay? And would uh, conquer the people and then settle there and then establish the the worship of Yahweh wherever they went. Okay. Now, um, so at, after a certain period of time, after many of these judges, the people wanted a king, and so they get a king named Saul, and he's not acceptable eventually to Yahweh. He Stuff loses his way. And so um, you now then have King David. And so King David has become a central figure in this um, history. Now with King David, we're also on firmer historical ground here. So King David is dated to about uh, 1000 BC. So here we're, we're pretty, um, you know, now we're on firm historical ground. Um, we know there was, you know, King David. And then, um, so David um, is basically a warrior king, right? He goes around and he consolidates um, all of Israel, right? And that whole region and sets the boundaries for what's Israel. And so um, he's, he was a warrior king very much, but also um, a very devoted follower of Yahweh. He produced many songs. Um, these are known as psalms. That many of them are in the Bible. Okay, upon his death, his son took over. And his name was Solomon. 
Now, Solomon, unlike his father, did not really have to fight any wars. He just had to consolidate um, the kingdom, so to speak. And so he, uh, in his case, he did a lot of building, including he built um, the, the temple. And so focused more on diplom diplomacy and so establishing Israel as a player in world affairs. Now, um, so he dies and he has a son take over. Uh, so I have to say Solomon's son. Let's not worry about his name. Oh, um, excuse me. All right, so um, you have Solomon's son take over. Now, uh, this he becomes significant because the people come to um, to to the king and saying, um, you know, under your grandfather we had to fight wars. Under your father, uh, we did a lot of building. And so people just want to go back to their farms and to their households and just settle down and enjoy the land that they've fought so hard to secure. Uh, but he refused to, to listen to them, and so this led to a civil war. Okay, and what happened eventually then is that that led to a split. Now, King David was from the tribe of Judah, Okay, and so you had in this civil war, the tribe of Judah remains faithful and loyal to the line of David. And um, with them, you have the tribe of Benjamin. That's the name of, of, of one of the smaller tribes. Okay, um, so you have two of these two tribes. And the, they form the southern kingdom. Okay, so that's the tribe. So, so this they were called. This kingdom was called the kingdom of Judah, and then you had um, the other side where the other ten tribes, and they retained the name Israel, and you know, they were the northern kingdom. So again, um, culturally, ethnically, they belonged to one broad unit. They worshipped the same God. Uh, which was very determinative back in, in those times. Um, but there's been a split, a political split, and it does affect them um, culturally because now you have this some relative isolation, so to speak, um, and you begin to have traditions develop, the same traditions develop in different ways um, in the two uh, different kingdoms. Okay, so we said we had a split. You have the northern kingdom, which consisted of ten tribes, and it retained the name Israel. And then you had the southern kingdom, which was basically two tribes, and they were called the kingdom of Judah. And this was the southern kingdom. Okay, now in 722 BC, the Assyrians um, are on the rampage and very powerful, and they come and they basically destroy the northern kingdom. Now, um, in the ancient world, in many cases, you have these. These conquests are not uncommon. Like one um, a group conquers another. Now, um, if not, even though northern Israel was uh, and the northern kingdom was was conquered, um, yeah, they could very well have survived and intact in terms of the culture and you know maybe political structure or something like that. But uh, the Assyrians completely uh, just demolished uh, the northern kingdom, right? And they com uh, completely assimilated them so that when they were done, there was no northern kingdom to speak of. The northern kingdom pretty much died right there. Okay, so they brought in a lot of people. They had them intermarry. Um, so the northern kingdom just basically no longer existed in the same way. So it, you know, that area was populated. It was, a, you know, it was its own sort of political cultural unit, but it just really could not retain the name Israel. Now, of course, you know, there was a very significant migration down Right, this way. So what happens here is that the southern kingdom now is the kingdom or is the part of this whole history that's preserving 
the entire history of Israel. Okay, so the southern kingdom now becomes uh, very, very significant because they're the ones now who, um, on whom the burden of the tradition rests because there's no northern kingdom. Now, the um, people from Judah were called uh, Judeans and um, gradually became known as Jews. So that's where Jews come from. So the Jews technically begin with Judea, right? right? And uh, they represent uh, a part of the history of ancient Israel. But we also have to remember that there was this whole tradition that died out, or this whole unit here that died out, right? And so uh, the Jews in some represent um, that whole history, but we just want to be aware that when we speak of ancient Israel, um, it includes the Jews, but also includes those who have, um, who are part of this whole ethnic unit that um, got separated. All right, um, then in 587, Babylon now um, conquers the southern kingdom and they destroy the temple. Okay, and so uh, Babylon, what it does is, uh, in order to prevent any revolutions or uprising, and they figure, well, the, the way to do that is you take away the educated classes, the elite, right? And so they round up all the elite, the educated classes, the priests, uh, the rulers, and, uh, you know, all those uh, people who would be sort of capable of organizing um, any kind of revolution. And um, they exile them to Babylon. And so this is called the exile. Okay, so it's a very significant part of... Uh, ancient Jewish history, and the prophet uh, Jeremiah like, speaks of this very movingly, um, and it's a very powerful thing uh, that happens, and um, a lot of exile spirituality is, is evident in the Old Testament. Now, so with, um, we have the, so we have the period of the exile, okay, and then uh, later in the century, uh, you have the Persians come in, and they um, then conquer the Babylonians. Now, the Persians were very different in the way they administered, administered uh, their kingdoms. So they pretty much allowed the locals to run their affairs as long as they paid their taxes and were not a problem. So the Persians allowed, so this is about 522-ish, BC. So the Persians allow the Israelites to return. So you had to exile and you had to return. And they rebuilt the temple. Now, um, this t period of exile, so this period of exile was in Babylon. Okay, and this is in the, so all of this is in the 6th century BC, right? The, um, you know, five hundreds. Now, this this period is, is uh, extremely important because this is when you begin to get um, a consolidation of the tradition. Consolidation. So, what do I mean by this? Um, what I mean is, uh, you had uh, priests and scribes begin to collect written traditions um, they edited them and then uh, put them together in a, in a narrative right? and so um, this is when you begin to get the biblical narrative as we see it today right they they begin to get all these units of writing that existed out there and you had traditions that came from northern kingdoms and traditions from southern kingdoms, and they put them side by side, right? So sometimes you have the same story that's told in slightly different ways, um, but that was of no concern to them. For them, it was still the revelation of, of God, and so they put these things together. And so this, is a, this time period is when we begin to get the Bible. 
Now, they also make, made decisions about the canon, right? What writings um, would constitute the, the sacred writings, okay? And the man often credited with that canon, leading that effort, is a man named Ezra. So we have, we have the exile, uh, we have the, so there's the exile, you have the, the, the Persian conquest and then the return and the building of the temple. Now, um, then in the 4th century, you have the rise of Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great um, is uh, basically is conquering huge swaths of the world that's available to them. So it includes Europe, Africa, and then he goes as far as the border of India. Now, uh, with Alexander the Great's movement um, come a common administrative language. So you get the spread of Greek. And also you begin to get um, roads and waterways and um, security, right? And people begin to move around. And so you get a, um, a number of Jews who are uh, in the diaspora that means they are spread out and they are Hellenic as in um, that's just the way they're Greek speaking Jews so Hellenic Jews that's Greek speaking <coughs> now with uh, um, so you have Jews spread out all throughout the Greek Empire, and the Greek Empire eventually gets split into four parts, um, and then eventually the, ne the next major um, empire becomes the Roman Empire, a republic, and then empire. And then um, this brings us to then the work that was done by um, Herod in the uh, rebuilding of of, uh, of the temple. This is closer to the time of Jesus. So um, in the interim, which I'm uh, skipping a lot of, but a lot happened um, in this time period. So in the in the two hundreds, um, one hundreds, uh, leading up to say the time of of Christ. Um, and so at that time, you you had a, another temple built, which was built by Herod. Okay, so this brings us to um, to about the time of Christ. Um, in another lecture, I speak about the rise of the Septuagint, which is the the Bible that the Greek speaking Jews used. And what they did was they um, they took the Hebrew Bible and they translated that into Greek and became a popular Bible for Greek-speaking Jews. And this becomes the Bible that Christians uh, adopt early on and becomes the standard Bible for Christians. Now, um, so Christ, his dates are uncertain, but let's say 4 B.C. to about 30 A.D. Okay, and then um, the other very significant thing that happens in the whole timeline of Israel um, and, and that's relevant for Christianity, would be the destruction of that temple that Herod was working on. So the destruction of the temple occurred in 70 AD. And this was very significant because um, in 1st century AD, um, in the Judaism of the 1st century, you had different sects. Okay, so you had uh, a group that were known as the Pharisees. You had a group known as the Sadducees. Um, you had a group, this is more of a political group, the Zealots. You had the Essenes, from whom we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then you had a group known as the Nazarenes. Okay, so the Nazarenes are essentially uh, the people who follow Christ and who we identify today as Christians. Now, um, the Sadducees were very much tied to the temple. So when the temple was destroyed, 
um, with time, they pretty much uh, vanished. So there were more of the upper class temple uh, priestly families. Now the Essenes, um, they also eventually get wiped out, although they did preserve a lot of um, their writings, which have become very important. The Zealots were very much a political party, and they get wiped out too. So um, the two branches of Judaism that survive are the Pharisees and the Nazarenes, or the Christians. Okay, and the Pharisees were more tied to the synagogue than they were to the temple, and the Nazarenes were, uh, or the Christians, were actually tied more to houses, to house groups, so little assemblies. Even though many of them worshipped at the temple, they did not need uh, a temple. So both groups could survive just fine um, without the temple. Okay, so what we've looked at is... Um, uh, so what we look at is an overarching narrative that begins with Abraham, and, and I try to to um, give just some major points along the way. Um, Talk about time of Christ and then the destruction of the temple in seventy A.D. Okay, now um, so the period of the Old Testament. Okay, it uh, covers this period from Abraham to about the time of Christ. And then the period of New Testament is from the period of uh, Christ to about 100 slash 120 AD. So that, that's New Testament. Okay, and so roughly speaking, this is a, this is a rough timeline that's sort of relevant for the Bible and for uh, Christianity. 